everybody, it's Miss Hamill and I'm here to talk to you about biomes. This is part two of our two-part lecture. In this video, we're gonna be talking about aquatic biomes. So aquatic biomes are going to make up the largest part of our biosphere, and they're either going to be freshwater or marine. So freshwater biomes are going to be the streams, rivers, lakes, or estuaries, and then marine will be our ocean area. So of course our oceans and the marine biome would be the largest in our world. Okay, so freshwater biomes, as I said, include lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and they're characterized by low salinity. So they have a low salt concentration of less than 1% um, dissolved salt in the water. So again, rivers, ponds, and lakes. Okay, marine biomes are going to be our largest biome in the world. It's going to cover about 70% of our Earth. It includes the five oceans, so the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, and Southern Oceans, as well as the many other smaller gulfs and bays. And it's going to be characterized by higher salinity, so the salt concentration is going to be at or above 3% salt dissolved in water. So they can be very productive, so our coral reefs are highly productive ecosystems. Okay, so the lakes, we're going to talk about lakes first, but they're going to be um, defined by four different zones that are defined by depth and distance from shore. So all aquatic biomes are going to be categorized into different zones or classified by different zones. And we are going to talk about the lake zones first. So the first one is the littoral zone. And the littoral zone is going to be near shore and it's going to be pretty shallow, well lit, and there are going to be a lot of plants, so rooted plants or floating plants. And the reason there are plants is because it is well lit. Then we have our limnic zone, and this is going to be open surface water, so slightly deeper than that near shore littoral region. And it's further from shore, deeper, but light easily penetrates through this area. So it has a lot of phytoplankton, zooplankton, and higher level animals that feed on the zooplankton and phytoplankton. And it produces the food and oxygen that is going to support the consumers in that lake. Then we have our profundal zone, and this is called the aphotic zone because there is not too much light or no light. It consists of the deeper regions, it's too dark for photosynthesis, the oxygen levels are going to be low, and it's going to be inhabited by fish that are going to be adapted to living in the darker, cooler waters. And then our last zone is the benthic zone, and it's the bottom of the lake. And it's inhabited by organisms that can tolerate the cool temperatures and low oxygen levels as well as no light. So all of the aquatic biomes are going to display some sort of vertical stratification. So up and down and layers up and down. And it's based on the physical and chemical vari variables within that lake. So it could be light, um, temperature, um, and different chemicals as well. So first we're gonna talk about light. And light is going to be absorbed easily in the upper layers and it's going to not penetrate through the lower levels of the light, therefore impacting the temperature and the organisms that can survive in that area. So ecologists are going to distinguish between these two zones based on light, and they are the photic zone, which is that top layer, and it receives a lot of light um, and enough for photosynthesis to occur, so it has a lot of organisms that can survive within this area and it's a warmer layer too, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Then we have the aphotic zone, or the profundal zone, which is that deeper area. It is deeper, so light cannot penetrate through to this area, and it is insufficient for photosynthesis, so there's not as much diversity or a lot of animals that can survive in this area. Okay, so as I said, um, the light impacts the temperature, so the light penetrated layer, so the photic zone is going to be warmed by the heat from the sun, and then the thermocline is going to be a basically a sharp, rapid 
change in temperature. So it's going to separate that warm layer from the cold layer. And it's the basically the warm layer and the cold layer are going to be pretty uniform. And then we have our deep layers that have that very cool water because the, the light's not penetrating to this area. So within our benthic zone, that deep water, um, there are going to be the substrate, the bottom of that lake is going to be made up of sand, um, organic and inorganic sediments. And it's going to contain detritus, which is dead matter, um, so dead organisms that are going to basically rain down and reach the sediment and then organisms that live in the benthic zone or the benthos are going to consume that detritus or that dead materia, material. So there is our benthic zone at the bottom. So lakes can be um, basically really impacted by the amount of nutrients that are in the water. So oligotrophic lakes are going to be deep lakes that are cold. There's a small surface area relative to depth and they are nutrient poor. So there's not very many nutrients, therefore there's not much photoplankton. And if there's no photoplankton, which would be the producer in this lake, they are not very productive. So they don't contain much light. And the water is going to be quite clear. So this here is an example of a ligotrophic lake. You can see it's very clear. Then we have our eutrophic lake and it's going to be shallow, warm, large surface area relative to depth, and also very nutrient rich. So there's a lot of nutrients which can support a lot of phytoplankton and other forms of life. And the water is often murky because of that um, high nutrient concentration. And there's going to be a high organic matter in the benthos because there's a lot of life and then that life is going to die or even poop that will feed the organisms that live in the benthos. Eutrophication is an important word to know. It is the process on which an oligotrophic lake becomes a eutrophic lake. Now, what happens is runoff. Um, so rainwater is going to bring nutrients and silt and pollution from fertilizers and into the lake. And this is going to cause explosions of algae. So algae is going to feed on these fertilizers and then it's going to decrease the oxygen content in that lake and then it can kill fish. Um, these are called algal blooms. Um, red tide is a very common one that we have here in Florida. So the zonation in marine biomes now, so again marine biomes are going to be our oceans um, as well as our bays, is five zones compared to the four zones in the um, lake zonation. Okay, these five zones include the intertidal zone, the neuritic zone, the ocean pelagic zone, the benthic zone, and the abyssal zone. So the intertidal zone is going to be that area where the tide or the water meets the land, and it is alternately submerged and exposed twice daily due to tide. So during high tide, the it is exposed to the water, the area is underwater and then during low tide it is exposed to the air and the elements. So it's a variations basically impact um, the organisms quite strongly so the organisms there need to be adapted to that exposure and it has huge variation between the um, salt water as well as temperature. The second zone is the neuritic zone and this is beyond um, the intertidal zone, so a little bit deeper, but it is shallow regions and it's over the continental shelf and it is going to be warm tropical waters. This contains the coral reefs. Um, it's very productive and it's easily impacted by pollution. So whenever waters become polluted, the organisms that live in this, um, this area of the water are going to be easily impacted and can, can die easily from that pollution. Then we have our ocean pelagic zones, and they are going to be even further out past the neuritic zones, and the waters can be very deep, and it's open water. 
So it's past the continental shelf and it includes most of the ocean's water and it can includes a lot of different types of organisms. So plankton are going to be the producers and then there are a great variety of free swimming animals. So fish, squid, sea turtles, and marine mammals live in this area, in this region. The next area is our benthic zone. And the benthic zone is at the bottom of the ocean. So it's below the neuritic zone, it's um, past the ocean pelagic zone. And nutrients, again, are going to rain down in the form of detritus, so dead organisms and even poop um, from organisms. And it's going to feed the organisms that live there. So the communities are going to consist of bacteria, fungi, seaweed and filamentous algae and lots of different invertebrates and fish. Now our abyssal zone is again at the very deep bottom of the ocean in the benthic communities and the organisms that live here have to be adapted to the cold, high pressure, limited light, so almost no light and low nutrients. In this region we have deep sea hydro thermal vents, which are really cool. Um, they're like underwater volcanoes, and they're dark, extremely hot. There's oxygen deficient, so there's not very much oxygen being produced, um, but other chemicals are being produced, so there's high sulfur concentration. And the producers here are chemoautotrophs, so they do not get light from the sun. However, they still produce their own food, they're still autotrophs, and they do this using the chemicals produced from the hydrothermal vents. So in this region, there are some really cool um, organisms that live here, and I'll show you some pictures. Okay, so organisms in our intertidal zone, so that area that is closest to um, the, the shore and actually is exposed, to the, to the sand and to the sun at some points of the day um, include uh, sea urchins and sea star and crabs and different crustacean as well as a lot of other different invertebrates, um, sea anemones, mussels, clams, limpets, um, so all different types of invertebrates. Then our life on our coral reef, so the next zone out in the nitric zone neuritic zone is going to include lots of different fish, um, excuse me, um, sea turtle, coral, which is actually our, um, not a plant, it is our um, base of the coral reef and it is an animal. And we have sharks, we have rays, we have so many different types of organisms living in this region. Um, so this is very diverse. This is actually considered one of the most highly biodiverse areas on our planet, meaning lots of different organisms. Our pelagic area of our ocean include organisms such as tuna, um, as marlin or different types of swordfish, our marine mammals, so whales, as well as sharks, so migrating species as well. And then life in our deep sea vent, so life at the bottom of the ocean, and this one is particularly around the deep sea vents, are going to include organisms that um, are adapted to that environment. So deep sea vents are very hot, as I said. So these worms are called giant tube worms, and these are giant clams, and they are adapted to this heat. And they actually are quite big. They are, the worms are two meters, about six feet long, and they have a symbiotic relationship with the chemosynthetic bacteria. So the chemosynthetic bacteria produces the food for them. And then there's giant octopi. This is about two meters long as well. Um, there are um, lots of really cool creatures, not around the deep sea vents, but just in the benthos, lots of organisms are adapted to produce light, um, or they are red in color because um, that's the color that is absorbed at that area. Okay, so lots of cool things about our aquatic biomes, and I hope you learned a little bit. Um, remember the different zones, that's important for your test. Okay, have a good evening and study on.